ramifications of labeling myself. I want to remind you that the American professional wrestling great George the Animal Steel once famously wrote, if you label me, you negate me. And uh, there's a lot of wisdom. Uh, I, actually, that might have been Kierkegaard. I, I get their writings confused. <laughs> uh, but uh, I do uh, a lot of narratology outside of my work on the Gospel of Thomas. I have worked a lot in narratology. But uh, today I want to ask some literary questions uh, with a view to asking both uh, historical and uh, even some theological questions. Uh, the second thing is that this, this final version, which I, I did finish writing before I came, was about 11,000 words. So I've cut out a great deal. Um, so if there's anything that sounds like it's missing, please ask me and I'll try to fill it in. I have several copies of the paper, the, the final paper with me if anybody's interested in actually reading the final version. So various cosmologies are reflected in the New Testament. And with these cosmologies come different understandings of the origins of evil. Within the Gospels in particular, there are individual and corporate sources of evil, along with the notorious harbinger of ill will known variously as Satan, the devil, the evil one, Beelzebul, the enemy, and the ruler of the world. My goal in this paper is to explore the role that evil plays in Markan and Johannine cosmologies and to delineate major differences as they relate to the mission of Jesus in each gospel. In particular, I aim to explore three questions. First, what is the primary source of evil in each narrative? Second, how does God, specifically through the agency of Jesus, intervene to overcome the evil that emerges in each narrative? And three, how do the answers to the previous two questions shed light on the different Christological presentations of these two gospels? So the mythological worlds of Mark and John introduce numerous realities, both human and otherworldly, that conspire to oppose Jesus' mission. The argument I will pursue in this paper proceeds as follows. In Mark, Jesus' chief opponent is Satan, who represents an opposing kingdom with its own satanic agenda. While in John's gospel, Jesus is continually opposed by the world, hakosmos, and I'm going to argue that this is obviously a very loaded concept for John, and the world's various representatives, including Satan, the ruler of the cosmos, see John 12, 31, 14, 30, 16, 11, the religious leaders, also known as hoiudaioi, it's a little bit too, uh, too loaded of an issue to get into today, the crowds and others. I recognize that these claims are somewhat monolithic in tone, though my argument is intended to function heuristically, suggesting prospects for future analyses of these texts. In other words, uh, things are not quite as tidy as what I'm going to suggest here today, but what I'm trying to do is, is raise some larger questions as a means of, of helping us um, uh, deal with these texts more honestly. So I'm guided here by the recognition that neither gospel offers a singular unified cosmology and um, I would say that the work of John Riches on uh, conflicting mythologies has been quite helpful for my thinking about this. Rather, each consists of elements drawn from potentially conflicting cosmologies that have coalesced within the documents as we now have them. My greater concern in approaching these two Gospels is to examine the world reflected in the final forms of these texts. In what follows, I will pay close attention to the contours of the worlds within the text while remaining mindful of the historical concerns in the worlds behind them. And of course, that's my, my nod to narratology, literary hermeneutics. So, overcoming Satan in the Gospel of Mark. Mark's view of the world in which Jesus lives undeniably belongs to the realm of apocalyptic eschatology. While there is significant debate over whether contemporary reconstructions of the historical Jesus should be articulated in eschatological or non-eschatological terms, scholars have long recognized the apocalyptic elements in the synoptics in general and Mark in particular. The story world of Mark's gospel assumes that a cosmic battle between God and Satan is underway, and this is how I envision it, by the way, uh, a cosmic battle is underway over which evil currently prevails and in which humans are, on their own, powerless with respect to evil. As this battle moves progressively toward a climactic showdown, Jesus will prevail and usher in the kingdom of God. And, and all of this is to say nothing of Mark's overtly apocalyptic material like chapter 13, the little apocalypse, or sayings like, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, etc., etc. So against the backdrop of this apocalyptic worldview, we will examine how evil functions in the gospel and how a paradoxical crucified Messiah ultimately overcomes Satan. After his experience in the wilderness, Jesus emerges proclaiming the advent of God's basileia, his, his reign, his dominion. For the Mark and Jesus, the inbreaking of this kingdom will be mediated primarily through three activities, preaching, healing, and exorcism. These are the activities in which Jesus most regularly engages during his ministry in the first half of the gospel, and they represent the substance of the disciples' ministry as depicted in the book in passages 3, 13 through 19 and 6, 7 through 13. If you, if you read these passages, they're appointed that they might be with them, that they might have authority to cast out demons. And then in chapter uh, 6, when they go out, these are the three things they do. They preach, they heal, and they cast out demons. 
So these three activities, I argue, reveal something about Mark's vision of how God will intervene to overcome evil. So public proclamation in the reign of God. In Mark's insipid, we have what is likely an objective genitive, to euangeliu Jesu Christu, the gospel about Jesus Christ. But the focus of this gospel, at least as Jesus preaches it, is rarely Jesus himself. And, and you know, for most early Christians and presumably Mark's original audience, the gospel was a specific proclamation that had Jesus at its center. Right? But that's not, in fact, how Mark has Jesus preaching the gospel. The gospel is, is about the nearness of God. It's about God's kingdom. So especially in the first half of the gospel, 1, 1 through 8, 30, whenever Jesus is found preaching and teaching, the focus is on God rather than himself, quite unlike what we'll see in the fourth gospel. The specific content of Jesus' inaugural message is found in Mark 1, 15. The time has been fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In this statement, we have two parallel units, for first of which is uh, consisting of two indicative clauses connected by Kai, and the second of which consists of two imperatives connected by Kai. And I have that uh, as uh, figure one in the little uh, handout that I provided there. Uh, Joel Marcus notes that this, quote, this parallelism is to be understood in the context of apocalyptic eschatology. The kairos, the old evil age of Satan's dominion, is now fulfilled, i.e., at an end. The new age of God's rule is about to begin, end quote. Therefore, Jesus' very first message in Mark is an announcement that Satan's rule has been vanquished, God's rule has been inaugurated, and action is required by those who hear. The idea that Satan's dominion has reached its end appears in another instance of Jesus' public proclamation, the so-called Beelzebub controversy in Mark 3. The middle section of this sandwich construction, verses 22 through 27, uh, Jesus utters a brief parable about plundering the house of the strong man, ha iskuras. We read in verse 26, And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the house of the strong man. On this parable, Marcus comments, quote, In the implicit allegory that has been created by the narrative, Satan is the strong householder, and Jesus is the stronger one who has invaded his realm, trussed him up securely, and plundered his goods. In the context, the parable implies that Jesus' exorcisms demonstrate the end of the dominion of Satan and the arrival of the dominion of God, end quote. And I would point out that in 1-7, John the baptizer had announced the coming of a, quote, stronger one, ha iskurateras. So we have Satan, the strong one, or the strong man, ha iskuras. But prior to that, when John the Baptist is proclaiming Jesus' coming, he refers to him at the very beginning as one who will be stronger, ha iskurateras. This language of strength we get throughout Mark especially in the, in the healings and exorcisms. So beginning with his wilderness struggle against Satan and on through the rest of the story, Jesus, the stronger one, is in the process of binding and overcoming Satan, the strong one. Thus, a key component of Jesus' public proclamation in Mark is that overcoming Satan is at the very heart of his mission. As the Basileia Tutha'u makes its full emergence into the world, the audience is progressively aware of the weakening of Satan's dominion until at the cross it is forever vanquished. And, and I would argue that this is connected to uh, how we understand the mustard seed. The mustard seed begins uh, slowly and incipiently and grows exponentially to where it becomes all-pervasive, just like the kingdom. Satan is vanquished, but we don't realize that until the cross. Exorcism healing in the reign of God. The remaining two elements of Jesus' mark and ministry, healings and exorcisms, are miraculous in nature and thereby represent direct challenges to the source of evil in Mark's cosmology. After Jesus preaches his inaugural sermon, his first two public actions are driving out an unclean spirit from a man in the synagogue, 1, 21 through 28, and healing Simon's mother-in-law, 1, 29 through 31. As the story moves forward, exorcisms and healings are ubiquitous and both prove to be key components of ushering in the reign of God. There is little dispute that Jesus' confrontations with the demonic are understood to be direct conflicts with satanic powers. But there is also a strong tradition in the Second Temple literature linking illness to the demonic, and I've provided just a few passages there. There's obviously many more. Mark's cosmology appears to be drawing from the well of this tradition. The result is that when the Mark and Jesus comes into contact with both sickness and the demonic, he is directly at war with Satan. In each instance, Jesus is able to succeed with relative ease in vanquishing Satan's schemes. And I, I have here a note to see the, the chart that I've provided. I've given you a chart where I look at the 11 specific instances in which Jesus uh, either casts out a demon or heals an individual or, or does both. So from that chart, of particular importance to the argument I've been advancing here is the scene depicted in Mark 5.20, 5, 1 through 20 rather, where Jesus is met by a demoniac living among the tombs. The audience learns that the man is possessed by a legion of demons that has imbued him with superhuman strength. 
In 5, 3 through 4, we read, This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Kai udes iskuen altan damasai. And of course, iskuen is uh, uh, the verbal cognate of uh, iskuras, iskuradaras. So there's that language again of, of power. However, Jesus proves to be more than capable of subduing the demoniac and again demonstrates that though Satan's dominion has been characterized by inhuman strength, he is the stronger one, ha iskurataras, who can subdue even the greatest of powers with mere words. Jesus' ministry, the religious leaders, and Satan's rule. So taken together, the cumulative weight of Jesus' preaching, healings, and exorcisms constitutes a major emphasis for the first half of Mark's Gospel, 1, 1 through 8, 30. However, after the transfiguration, 9, 1 through 13, and the exorcism that follows, 9, 14 through 29, Satan seems to disappear completely from the narrative. And after Bartimaeus receives his sight in 10, 46 to 52, all healings cease. From this point forward, Jesus will primarily be at odds with the religious leaders. So, how are we to account for the seeming disappearance of Satan from the narrative, especially if, as I'm arguing, Satan is the overarching enemy, the source of evil in the narrative? I'm going to answer. In light of the foregoing discussion, there appears to be another connection between the religious leaders and satanic dominion that has been overlooked. Within the narrative, the religious leaders, and I'm saying as broadly conceived, okay, I'm not making a historical argument here, within the context of the narrative, the religious leaders as broadly conceived are not only keepers of various Jewish traditions, but also managers of the temple or household or oikos of God. Three times in Mark, the temple is referred to as God's oikos, 226 and twice in 1117, all three of which derive from quotations of the Septuagint. It was also quite common within the culture of Second Temple Judaism to refer to the temple as the oikos theu, or, or, or oikos kuriu, uh, in the sense of Beit Adonai. An awareness of this convention suggests a link between the oikos of the strong man in Mark 3 and the corrupt oikos of God in Jerusalem. This piece is my own uh, little heresy here. I, I didn't read this anywhere, but I started thinking about uh, the strong man in the oikos and, and that particular connection. So as discussed above in our consideration of the parable of the strong man, Satan is the powerful householder, tain oikion tu iskuru from 327. Thus the use of this term oikos for the temple suggests to me at least that a real rather than parabolic oikos over which Satan exercises dominion is the temple, which Jesus condemns and describes in 1117 as a den of robbers. All right, so I'm turning now to evil in Mark's Christology, and then we'll look at John. We turn now to a consideration of how this understanding of evil relates to Mark's Christology. The principal Christological titles employed by, employed by Mark are Messiah, Christos, and Son of God, Hahuias tu Theu. As discussed above, Jesus' roles in the Mark and drama are those of preacher, healer, exorcist, and ultimately crucified one. Therefore, the question before us is this. How do these roles align with the recognition that Jesus is Messiah and Son of God? Now, it is not too difficult to imagine what it would have meant for Mark's earliest audiences that a figure identified as Messiah or Son of God preached, healed, and drove out demons. These were, in fact, part and parcel of the religious tradition to which they were heirs. The death of Jesus at the hands of his enemies, however, would have been much more problematic. In the first half of Mark, Jesus is an agent of God's will, ushering in, <clears throat> excuse me, ushering in God's reign. As preacher, exorcist, healer, he stands in a long line of those proclaiming what God would do in the future by demonstrating what God could do in the present. It is not until the cross, however, that Mark's announcement of Jesus as Messiah and Son of God makes sense within the context of the story world where Satan is the principal source of evil. Through the ministry of Jesus, the kingdom is inaugurated, but only through his death and resurrection is Satan overcome and God's dominion established on the earth. And, and I would add uh, somewhat uh, uh, in response to, to what Lauren had to say yesterday, um, uh, evil is obviously not uh, experientially, existentially in the life of the community defeated. Right? But I would say in terms of Mark's narrative universe, I think this is how Mark intends uh, us to read uh, the vanquishing of Satan's kingdom here at the cross. All right, so overcoming the world in the Gospel of John. It is possible to point out several major differences between the Mark and the Johannine presentations of Jesus' ministry. But most important for our purposes here is the recognition that John does not display an apocalyptic cosmology like what we find in Mark. What can we say of John's cosmology, and in what way does it impact our understanding of the origins and role of evil in the gospel? First, it must be admitted that modern discussions of John's cosmology have been complex, with some concluding that a specific background is impossible to identify with any certainty. Second, it is a confounding irony that as important as cosmology is to an interpretation of the gospel, cosmology per se is not a major concern within the narrative. 
In other words, decisions about John's cosmology made prior to interpreting the prologue ultimately proved foundational to the interpretive lens through which scholars have read the entire gospel. And I would say that uh, for a historically conspicuous example of this, just look at Rudolf Bultmann's Gnostic Redeemer myth, which colored everything he said. It was a brilliant reading of the gospel. I think he was wrong, but it colored everything he said after that. And if you look at how many people treat John's Lagos, it, it ultimately ends up coloring their entire reading. So scholars have variously read John's Lagos in light of Greek philosophy, Philonic exegesis, incipient forms of Gnosticism, rabbinic mysticism, and other expressions of sectarian Judaism. Uh, I know uh, I will have some opposition, uh, probably even here in this room, but I think we can say that however we identify John's uh, cosmology, we cannot describe it as apocalyptic, at least not uh, in the sense of a thoroughgoing apocalypticism like what we have in, in Mark. And I'm feeling uh, that I might get some questions from Lauren and Utah as I uh, read several articles recently in which they both argued that John did have some intimations of apocalyptic. Um, here I will argue, uh, somewhat vaguely, that John reflects a backdrop within first century diaspora Judaism and that the prologue should be read in light of Torah. Within the story of the incarnate Lagos, John introduces his audience to the multi-layered and I would say theologically rich term, cosmos. In Hellenistic Greek, cosmos carries a range of meanings, several of which are employed in this gospel. These include nuances related to the material reality of the created world, the physical realm into which Jesus has entered, and the object of God's affection and salvific intentions. What is perhaps most important for analyzing the role of the world in John's cosmology is its metonymical use to denote humanity. Characteristically, John employs cosmos as a technical term for humanity, and in those contexts, the term has a, quote, distinctly pejorative meaning. I'm quoting Stanley Merrow there, his article, Cosmos and John. Before we can appreciate the specific nuance of this term, we need to understand the role of the cosmos in the Gospels prologue. And um, I do read everything uh, in John through the lens of the prologue. Uh, when I describe this to students, I say, if you've ever watched an episode of Columbo, reading the Gospel of John is, is like watching an episode of Columbo. Right? The first 15 minutes of Columbo, you, the viewer, find out everything that's going to happen. Uh, you know who the bad guy is. You know who the crime is, uh, how the crime was committed. You know the motivation for the crime. And then you watch Columbo stumble along, fumble along, finding out what you already know. Okay? It's the same way in the fourth gospel. We have this prologue that gives us 18 verses, this explicit and very detailed introduction to who Jesus is. And then we get to watch everybody in the narrative struggle to come to terms with what we already know. So I think the cosmos is, uh, I mean, excuse me, the, law, the prologue is the key. And it's certainly the key for how we understand both logos and cosmos. So two proleptic statements from the prologue describe a progressively unfolding reality within the story. The first is 110. He was in the world, ento cosmo, and though the world, hakosmos, was created through him, the world, hakosmos, did not know him. Two different nuances seem to be present in this one verse. The first and second uses of cosmos refer to the realm into which Jesus has entered, while the third refers to humanity. This statement prepares the audience for humanity's rejection of Jesus, not only across the narrative, but also builds upon the narrative's previous statement that the darkness has not understood the light. See 1.5. Verse 11 then reiterates the substance of verse 10. Quote, he came to his own place, ta idia, and his own people, hoi idioi, did not receive him. The neuter plural use of idios in the first half of the verse is a reference to the physical realm into which Jesus has entered, and the masculine plural use of idios in the second half of the verse refers to humanity. The world thus represents the internal orientation and our, believer, uh, excuse me, our behavior of all those who po oppose the light. And I have here on this handout uh, something that suggests that this might be synthetic parallelism, and I'm just using that as a, as a way of helping us understand the unknown in light of the known. When you do uh, Hebrew poetry, uh, you learn about synthetic parallelism where a line is given and then the second line serves to reiterate and clarify the substance of the first. That seems to me to be how 110 and 11 work here. Okay, so. The world versus the word. In this part, I cut quite a bit out, so I'll just give sort of a cursory reading of, of these passages. So a handful of passages depict the relationship between Jesus and the cosmos. Humanity's collective opposition to Jesus manifests itself primarily in two ways, hatred slash rejection or misunderstanding. Four texts in particular depict the hostility of the cosmos toward Jesus. 7, 1 through 7, 14, 15 through 17, 15, 18 to 21, and 17, 14 through 15. In 7, 1 through 7, Jesus' brothers encourage him to travel to Judea and make his works known publicly. Jesus explains that the world is not able, Udunatai, to hate them, though it hates him because he testifies publicly about the world's evil deeds. The world is thus constrained by its hatred for Jesus, but is not able to hate those who share its perspective. We have a real dualism here. In 14, 
In this section, Jesus has begun instructing the disciples about the coming of the Parakletas. This advocate, whom Jesus identifies as the spirit of truth in verse 17, will reside in the disciples and guide them in the future. The world, however, is not able to receive the spirit, nor can the world see or come to know the spirit. The world cannot, udunatai, understand or come to know the Father because it is fundamentally opposed at an existential level to the things of God. In both of these passages, Jesus uses udunatai to describe it as, I think, more than just simple ability. I think it's, a, it's an existential reality. They are bound up in their opposition to the word, and therefore they are not able to see or partake of the things of God. Chapter 15. Verses 18 through 21. Again, here, Jesus clearly states that the world hates him, adding that the world also hates anyone who belongs to him. The world's hatred will lead it to persecute Jesus and his followers, all of which results from their not knowing the Father. Ironically, the world's persecution and eventual killing will result in the world's defeat. And, and Jesus says this very explicitly through a, a proleptic statement in 1633. I have overcome the world using the perfect. In John 17, Jesus closes the farewell discourse with what has come to be known as his high priestly prayer. In the middle of the prayer, he petitions the Father to protect the disciples because the world has, quote, hated them just as it has hated me. The world, under, the world now misunderstands Jesus, and I'll run through these quickly because I think I'm running out of time. Um, in verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 19, the setting in which this verse appears is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It is noteworthy that in verse 16, the disciples do not understand the meaning of this event. This understanding also applies to the crowds who are claiming Jesus as king. In verse 19, the Pharisees lament that, quote, the whole world has gone after Jesus. This crowd response is a, uh, what I'm calling here, a signs faith. And throughout John, uh, a signs faith really proves to be an illegitimate basis upon which to believe. Okay? Rather, it is those who embrace Jesus on the basis of his word who are exalted within the narrative. Therefore, the statement that the world has gone after Jesus aligns with the evaluative point of view of the narrator and reinforces the idea that the world has fundamentally misunderstood Jesus' mission. 1620, the center of chapter 16, Jesus is preparing the disciples for his departure to the Father. The audience knows that he must return to the Father in order to complete his mission on earth, but this will be a cause of grief for the disciples. Jesus claims that the world will rejoice at his departure. Ironically, however, the world will rejoice in ignorance, believing that Jesus' departure is a victory. I'm going to skip this last one, and I'm going to move on quickly to uh, Satan, the ruler of the cosmos. By the way, I'm not here suggesting that Leo DiCaprio is, in fact, Satan. But I will say that when my wife drug me to this movie 18 years ago, I, had, I did feel like I descended into hell for about three hours. Um, <laughs> uh, Satan makes several appearances in John. The term Satanas appears once, 1327, and Diabolos is used three times, 620, 844, 132. But the designation that is most important for, for today, for my study, is Ha'archon tu Kazmu, the, the ruler of the world. The gospel's emphasis on humanity as the cosmos is no doubt related to its insistence that Satan is the ruler of the cosmos. Three times, in, say, uh, in, three times Satan is called the ruler of the or the ruler of this world, 1231, 1430, 1611. And though the title seems to suggest dominion, Satan does not appear to function as the overarching enemy of Jesus. It is actually rather difficult to delineate the exact function of Satan vis-a-vis -vis the cosmos. John's Satan figure is neither completely in control of events on the earth nor completely separate from the impulses of humanity, which makes for a somewhat confusing taxonomy of evil. All three instances in which Jesus speaks of Ha'archon tu Kosmu definitely, in, excuse me, definitively indicate that he will not pose a significant threat to Jesus' mission, though his opposition to Jesus is bound up in humanity's resistance to God. In the face of this dual opposition from the cosmos and its ruler, Jesus' victory appears certain, see 1227, 1633. Utah has helpfully summed up for us the role of Satan in John by noting that, quote, the archon is the force behind the world in its state of refusal to acknowledge Christ. He is personified unbelief. Satan, therefore, works hand in glove with the cosmos, for which he is the not completely powerless figurehead. Okay, so he's not the, he's not the chief enemy, but he's not completely powerless either. All right, postscript. These are my last three things here in the we'll, uh, Christological trajectory. So in demonstrating the critical differences in Mark and in Johannine cosmologies, I've tried to make the case that in these Gospels, uh, cosmology, evil, and Christology are intimately connected to one another. The second Gospel assumes an apocalyptic worldview in which Jesus' battle against evil culminates in a decisive victory on the cross. 
Within the thought world of the fourth gospel, however, the cross consummates the revelation of God rather than the defeat of evil. With these differences in mind, it remains to raise a few historical questions. So first, there is strong evidence that belief in and devotion to Jesus as an exalted figure can be traced back to some of our earliest sources. While Mark's Christology is much higher than is sometimes allowed by scholars, the Christology of the fourth gospel is among the highest in the New Testament and is framed within what is largely a non-apocalyptic narrative universe. So against that backdrop, does John's exalted Christology necessitate the abandonment of an apocalyptic worldview, or vice versa, does John's rejection of apocalyptic necessitate a more exalted Christology? Okay. Second, there is also strong evidence, in my opinion, for the position that the fourth gospel was familiar with the gospel of Mark. I'm, I'm probably uh, in the minority on that. However, irrespective of one's position regarding the relationship between the two gospels, it must be judged implausible that John would have been completely unfamiliar with traditions portraying Jesus as an exorcist. I just don't think, I don't think that's possible. So John's avoidance of material depicting Jesus as an exorcist suggests an intentional distancing from this prominent early tradition. Was it then part of John's agenda to break from this early Christological paradigm in order to fashion a more cosmic, and I'm going to get in trouble probably with this word, a consequently more docetic Christology? And then I'll just skip through to this last one as it's not important. In light of the foregoing discussion, could John Cosmology and Christology tell us anything about uh, the provenance of the fourth gospel? Thank you.